Am I audible? Great, thanks. Our next speaker is Basileos Klimas, and he's going to be telling us about how to take back control, or perhaps how to take back control flow. Let's give him a warm welcome. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. I'm going to share with you our experience on using formal modeling to rectify problems, uh, problems with uh, uh, structured control flow rules in the specification of an intermediate representation for GPU computing. Now, the language we are talking about is called SPIRV. SPIRV is consumed by Vulkan GPU drivers. Vulkan is an open source uh, application programming interface for rendering two-dimensional and three-dimensional vector graphics. Now, you might not have heard of SPIRV and Vulkan, but just to give a feel of their penetration, SPIRV and Vulkan are deployed in more than 2 billion Android devices. There are more than 3 billion active Android devices, 77% of which are SPIRV capable. Now, SPIRV and Vulkan are developed and maintained by Kronos Group. Kronos Group is a consortium of industry-leading uh, media-centered, let's say, companies which work together to advance and improve uh, interoperability standards for media. These are only few of the contributing members of Kronos. All major GPU vendors do support SPIRV, and you can find SPIRV deployed at almost any platform and operating system, okay? Consoles, uh, game consoles, cloud services, system on chips. Also, all major game engines do support SPIRV. Now, the aim of SPIRV is to make life easier for GPU compiler uh, writers. Okay, let's see how. Uh, firstly, in order to manipulate an image before it is drawn to the screen, developers are using the so-called shaders. A shader is a piece of code which is executed to the GPU. There is a lot of intricacy about shaders, how you pass the geometry to the GPU, how you calculate and implement the perspective, the lighting, etc. But we are focusing here only on the control flow of these shaders. Now, these shaders can be written in different high-level languages. Few of them are shown here. Now, naively, in order for the drivers, GPU drivers, to ingest these shaders, you would need here to maintain a set of uh, shader compilers so that you can compile every high-level front end into the machine code here. SPIRV instead removes this need. Now, by being a target compiler itself, it allows the front end, high-level language front ends, to emit their shaders in a standardized form in intermediate form, and then this can be easily injected by having here only one compiler, the SPIRV compiler, okay? And this is idea of every intermediate language, like the LLVM, for example. Now, functions in SPIRV are represented by a control flow graph of basic blocks. A basic block is a sequence of instructions without any branch in it. Now, this control flow graph have to obey a set of rules which is stated in the SPIRV specification. However, these rules had many problems. We identified plenty of problems with these rules. These problems were well known in the community even before we started pursuing this project, but the approach of the SPIRV designers dealing with these problems was by patching the rules, adding exclusions, adding exceptions, making these rules um, rather convoluted, complex, okay? So, in order to fix this problem, we set off formalizing the control flow rules, and we encoded the rules into Alloy. Alloy is a declarative model, modeling language, and every rule, control flow rule, was represented by an axiomatically as an axiom in Alloy. And this way, we were able to improve and reformulate an important part of the SPIRV specification, as we will see a bit later. Then we went through a validation process by cross-checking our model against other SPIRV resources like conformance test, 
suites and uh, other develop official developer uh, tools that are supporting SPV language. And we also developed a novel fuzzing, a novel fuzzer, novel fuzzing uh, technique in order to find bugs to probe the compilers and translators, GPU translators, and find bugs into them. Now, our work has impacted on the improvement and reformulation of an important part of the SPRV specification. Our work led to fixes in SPRV validation tooling and conformance tests, and our father revealed 20 bugs in different compilers, known GPU compilers and translators. Now, to give a glimpse of the convolution of the control flow rules in the old version of the specification, I'm going to go through a small example here. Let's say we have this straight line for blocks without any construct in that. And to make things more interesting, let's replace two blocks by two conditionals, just two if constructs here. Now, the blocks highlighted in yellow represent the selection construct for each conditional here, according to the definitions in the SPV specification. Now, to make things more interesting, let's add an outer loop, which encloses these two conditionals. And now the blue cloud here, which shadows the block here, represent the set of blocks which constitute the loop construct that we just added here. And to make things even more interesting, let's add another for loop here, a very simple loop. Now, it is important important to note that the nesting information is made by the program explicit to the compiler, and the compiler is exploiting this information in order to generate efficient code. Okay, this is very important. Now, let's say, imagine that there is a break from the second conditional to the header of the second loop that we added. Now, clearly, we would not expect this to change the nesting relationship. Okay, for the reason that we mentioned earlier. However, according to the definition of the old version of the SPRV specification, this break would drag the whole loop, the second loop, into the selection construct of the second conditional. And this is definitely something that the developers, the designers, the SPRV designers didn't want to happen. And in order to get rid of this, to tackle this problem, they used to patch the rules by adding exclusions, adding uh, exceptions, saying something like, okay, the selection contract consists of this block, but let's exclude this because of this weird case and this and this. And we will see a concrete uh, rule uh, later and you will understand better what's going on. We will revisit this example in a bit and we will understand it. Now, in order to tackle this sort of problems that we saw, we designed and implemented a formal model for the control flow rules in SPRV. So as a first step, we started by a best effort initial interpretation of the informal SPRV specification based on careful reading and discussion with SPRV experts from different, from Google mainly. Then in order to establish the truthfulness of this model that we have designed, we went through a validation process by cross-checking our model against two sources of truth. The first one is a number of conformance test suites that are available publicly. So what we did, we extracted the control flow graph from these conformance test suites and checked them against our model. In case we observed some mismatch between them, in that what our model believes and what the conformance test claims. Then we discuss this with the experts and either we fix the test case in question from the conformance test suite or we refined, debug, tweaked our model so that we achieve an agreement between. And we did this iteratively again and again for every single test case that we uh, subtracted from the conformance test suite until we reached an agreement between our model and all the tests that we tried. Now, as a second line of this validation process, we generated plenty of interesting valid and invalid control flow graphs. 
and we pass them to the official SPV validator that is maintained by Kronos, which is supporting the SPV language. Again, in the same fashion, in case there was a mismatch between what our model believes and what the outcome from the SPV validator is, we had a chat with the experts, and either the SPV validator was fixed, debugged, or our model was refined so that we can achieve, again, an agreement here. Having established agreement between our model and the two sources of truth, the, the conformance test suites and the SPV validator, then we took all the encoded rules from Alloy and decoded them now, translated back into English prose so that we can get now the new version of the SPV specification. And this was a tricky procedure because always from formal to informal, there is something that you will lose on the way. Okay? And we did this iteratively, and we stopped until we and the experts were happy with the elegance and the simplicity of the rules that were introduced in the new version of the SPV specification. So the main takeaway from this slide is that we changed the specification here. The, specific, the current version of the SPV specification is the one including the changes that we proposed. Now, traditionally, a control flow graph, we will find one type of edge which represents the transfer of control from one basic block to another, like the one that you see here. In SPV, however, the control flow graphs include three types of edges. On top of the traditional one that we mentioned, we have the so-called merge, which indicates where control flow converges after a conditional switch or loop are the highlighted in green in the example that you see on the right. And we have a third one, the so-called continue, with links loop headers to their continue targets, indicating the continue construct. Okay, the continue construct keeps the current iteration of the loop and jumps the control to the end of the loop for the second iteration. Now, these two new type of edges does not, do not change the way the program executes. So there, is, there is no semantic meaning in them. They are merely used in order to define easily the structure control flow rules and the constructs for, for different cases. Now, the control flow analysis relies heavily on the key idea of dominators. And we know from the compilers that a node A dominates a node B if every path from the entry to node B includes node A. However, this kind of computation does not consider merge and continue edges, but only control edges, okay? The solid arrow that are shown in the example here. And this leads to problematic examples like the one we saw earlier. And why is that? Because the fact that this loop was dragged to the selection construct of the second conditional was be because the header here of the selection construct dominates this block here. So by applying the traditional dominance that we just saw, we had this effect of dragging the loop, the entire loop to the selection construct, which we do not want to happen. The speed designers did not want to happen, and they were trying to eliminate this behavior by patching the rules in different ways. We are following a more radical approach, so we are considering as uh, for dominance, not only the control edge, but all three edges that we mentioned, merge and continue. So by considering only the control edges, we said that three dominates three to seven. Why is that? Because in order to go to the highlighted in blue blocks from the entry point or one, you have to go through three always. There is no other path that you can bypass three. This is the idea of dominance. Now, by considering for example, the merge blocks doesn't change the dominance relationship for this example, but for other examples it could change. And we can see here, if we add the highlighted in red now, the, which is a continue edge, you will see now something changed. Seven is no more dominated by three. Why? Because of this edge now. There is a new path now from one, two to seven, 
which bypasses 3. So 3 does not dominate 7. Just I wanted you to put this to compare between the tradition of the regular uh, dominance relation and the one that we are proposing here, which we are calling structural dominance, the one that considers all three types of edges that we mentioned. And we observed that by using structural dominance in uh, computing the constructs in the control flow graphs, things are much easier, cheaper and uh, simpler. Okay, cheaper com computationally. And we encoded both structural dominance and the regular traditional one. And so we saw a huge difference in alloy in terms of uh, performance. Now, let's revisit again the example that we saw earlier. We said that this loop was dragged into this selection construct here of the second conditional. But now, applying the structural dominance, this does not happen now. Why? Because of this edge here that we are considering in our uh, dominance. So there is a path now from the entry point to these blocks here, which does not include the header of the selection construct, which used to drag all the loop here. Now, this is a concrete, a real a rule from the old version of the SPIRV specification. You don't need to go through and read understand this. Just what you have to keep in mind that there are two parts in this rule. The first one is talking about what blocks are included in the constructs. And the second part of this rule is what blocks are excluded that have been included in this uh, first part of the rule. So this is what I meant by saying that the designers were patching the rules by exclusions, exceptions, adding exceptions for every issue that they observed on the way. They were making the rules more and more complex on the way. Okay. Now, one problem that we found, for example, here, you will see the outer construct this rule is talking about was not even defined in the old version of the SPIRV specification. And we defined it and we make it clear what this construct includes, consists of. Now, as I said, by replacing now the dominance with the new notion of structurally dominance that we introduced by considering all types of edges, we saw that the second part of this rule is superfluous, no needed anymore. Because the first part now is considering everything, is ruling out every these cases that before were excluded by patching the rules on the way. Okay, so we just got now a new rule, which half, it is half of the rule of the old version. And it's much, not only simple, half, but it's much cheaper computationally to compute the constructs in using this way. Now, another part of our work is we have introduced a novel fuzzer for finding bugs in GPU compilers and translators. Now, you can think of fuzzing as an automated version of monkeys at the keyboards, in that you can submit randomly test cases in order to probe the GPU compilers and find bugs and explore the state space of the compilers. Of course, you would need here a test oracle so that you can compare the output of the result, the output of, the, of executing the test case against this oracle. Now, let's see how we implemented the fuzzing, our fuzzing technique here. This is a control flow graph, which is from a real bug that we found in one of the compilers we tested. Now, first thing that we do is we just pick a random path in this control flow graph. Let's say this green highlighted path here. And then we add instrumentation instructions to this control flow graph so that we force the program to take this path upon execution. And we call this process flashing, because the instruction that we are adding to force this path to be taken, it's like adding flash to the bones of the control flow graph skeleton that we have in hand here. Next, we add instruction, instrumentation, to record the path that will be taken at runtime when it is executed on compilers, and we check whether there is a match between them. If there is a match, then the program is compiled correctly. Otherwise, we are talking about a miscompilation bug. 
And if we look this from another point of view, what we do is we generate control flow graph skeletons, either using our model or using uh, control flow uh, conformance test suites, which are publicly available. Then we add instrumentation to force the program to take the path that we randomly choose. Then we add instructions to record the path that will be taken when the test case is executed to the compiler. And then we augment the program with an oracle test just by asserting that there should be a match between the expected path and the path that will be taken uh, at runtime. Okay, so suddenly we have now a self-checking test program which is Oracle equipped. Okay, everything is done now automatically. It's done by the, by the program itself. So now what we have to do is just execute this to the compilers. We probe the compilers and we check whether the assertion holds or not by the end of the execution. So, using this technique, we found 20 bugs in different uh, GPU compilers and uh, translators, 15 of which have been found by using the test cases that were generated by our model. The others are obtained by uh, using control flow graphs from different conformance test suites. And this is important. We have found triple the bugs using our model, and this is indicative of the importance of having a formal model for this language. Of 20 bugs, 13 are already fixed by vendors. Four are acknowledged as problematic. They are working on it. The others are in progress. We haven't heard back from them. Okay. This is a breakdown of the types of bugs that we found, miscombination and crashes, and you can see there the compilers and translators we tried we fast using our technique. To wrap up, just we started by identifying a bunch of problems with control flow rules in the SPAV specification, and then we modeled these control flow rules, encoding them in alloy, and this allowed us to converge upon a more elegant and simple set of rules, which we then translated back into the new version of the specification. And we achieved a consensus between all experts through the validation cross-checking process that I mentioned earlier. So everyone was happy, the experts, there was an agreement between our model and conformance test suites and the, the different uh, developers tools that are supporting the SPAV language. We contributed changes to the SPAV specifications. The rules that we, you will read in the new version of the SPAV specifications are the ones that we proposed and we have written there. And last but not least, we have developed a novel fuzzer which found 20 bugs in different compiled GPU compiled and translators, which leverages as well our formal model to generate test cases and probe the GPU compilers and explore the state space for bugs. That's all I had. All right. Thank you. Please uh, raise your hand and you'll have the mic handed to you. Uh, I have a question about your slide about the while loop you spend a while. But it looks like your initial while loop control flow diagram was wrong. You always have the edge from the while entrance to the around the loop, right? Why you have to add it? You are talking for the, uh, which, yeah. which control flow graph? For while, while loop, where you said uh, we introduced structural control rules, and you added new branch at the site. It looks like you had a do while loop before, uh, not the while. Here, yeah, this one? Uh, we don't see a screen right now. Uh, uh, before that, or after that. There was just one slide for the while loop. Yeah, this one, yeah. This one, okay, so yes. It introduces this right edge there, but it's always there in the while loop because if condition is not satisfied, you don't enter the while loop, you jump to seven. So the red line is always there. And you said you're adding that? Are you talking this edge here? Yeah, yeah. So what's the problem with this? You said that you have to add it artificially because it wasn't in the original control graph. And so yeah, this is a symbolic one, just indicating just linking the loop header with, uh, this is not a real control transfer of uh, control in the control program. This is a symbolic one which helps us to compute 
the constructs in the control flow graph. This does, has no semantic meaning at all. Okay, it does not change the way the program executes. This is just for us to compute the constructs. So how and it was there, it was not something that we introduced, it was there in the spe spe specification. So how the program executes if, if condition is not satisfied and, 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 and number two, where the control goes? Yeah, the problem... Uh, and number two, in the node number two? Yes. What happens if there is false, while false? Here. Okay. We, we merge here. This is the merging here. So we resume, resume again as long as the condition holds true. Otherwise, we merge here. Uh, okay. Okay, so it's eight, not seven. Sorry. Yeah. Time for one more very brief question. Hello, uh, I'm Jed Gallini from the University of Cambridge. Uh, very quick one. Uh, just so these edges, you say they have no semantic meaning. So does that mean it's valid to have a discovery analysis pass that tries to insert these edges? Can you say it again, please? So, so there is no, no semantic meaning, yes. Yeah, I, I so, so, so if I write an analysis pass that, say, looks for if statements or looks for while loops and, like, inserts the appropriate edges, would that uh, be semantically valid, assuming, I'm guessing, you know, some dominance conditions are uh, imposed on the source and target to the no. inserted edges? No, it will not, no. Wait. Huh? No, 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 it will not make any difference. Yeah, so, so it would be valid to yeah. do something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so this is like a way of storing the information of analysis passes. Exactly, yeah, it's just, just for facilitating us to compute the constraints. Yeah, so, so it's like metadata. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, let's thank Vasileos once again. Thank you.